Dan Everhart joining me now, CEO of Canary. I'm really appreciative of you joining us, Dan. We really want to get your point of view of how deep and how long you think the effects to the OFS sector will continue. Uh, well, I think that the, the effects are going to be awful severe, probably a once in a career uh, level of sin severity. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm actually hoping that this is a very steep but very quick recovery. Uh, I think it's you know demand led, and when America opens up, then that's going to clear a lot of the the oversupply of oil and gas. And what about your strategy for managing through the demand loss? Can you share any of that with us? Sure. Well, um, it, it, first of all, I would just say it's heavy, um, but you know we're really looking trying to rationalize the company and, and push expenses down where where possible, and we're really trying to remove you know anything we can expense wise. So there's, you know, money for uh, payroll, insurance, and fuel, and then pretty much push nearly everything else uh, so we can, you know, focus on our team and on, on staying uh, in business right now. I'm sure that weighs heavily on you and uh, the leadership and, well, everyone yeah. helping to make decisions. Yeah, no, it's, I think it's really tough for our senior management team and, and for our guys, you know, I think, you know, uh, you know our, our workers are used to quite a bit of overtime and we're usually pretty busy. And we've been pretty busy the past few years and to, to have overtime cut and have wage reductions and everything is is uh, weighing on you know a lot of people's families right now I think. Very hard to deal with. What about Dan the role uh, that service providers can play as a potential bounce back if you will or at least managing this new price environment for the industry that we are waiting to see? Well, I think, you know, to the extent we can lower prices, although I say that in the, the oil companies, you know, they want us to lower, lower, and lower with no end in sight. But, you know, to the extent we can get skinnier with our pricing, I think it helps them keep drilling. Uh, and then also, I think, you know, us just being around on the other side of this is going to be helpful. You know, there will be an oil boom at some point. I, I don't know if it's six months or 18 months or five years, but there will be a, a boom on the other side of this. That's the history of this industry. And, you know, the service companies being around, well, what, or what will make that possible for the oil companies on the other side. And do you have thoughts on pro rations? I mean, not even just really the discussions that have been in Texas, but anywhere really? Yeah, so I, and I, I testified before the Texas Railroad Commission and, uh, you know, against the pro ration. I think it's a, a bad idea. I understand where Commissioner Sidden was coming from, but, you know, I, I'm a big believer that the free market will solve and the free market, frankly, will get there quicker. So these oil companies know they're producing too much. Refiners are telling them, you know, we don't want the order to cut back. Um, they know that these stripper wells need to be shut in and, and even some of the more prolific wells. So I'm a big believer that the, the free market is as messy as this is. The free market and, and will reign and survival of the fittest um, will, will shake the industry out. And that really kind of uh, continues into my next question about your thoughts about the government, the White House in particular. Do you think they should step in at all? Yeah, so I've had uh, uh, many discussions with the administration in the past month, month and a half, and I think that they, there's been an awful lot of noise and an awful lot of um, interest in doing something. I think, you know, if, if the point is to help save the industry and help save jobs, I would say at this point they've come up a little bit short, uh, but they definitely seem very interested in having the oil and gas on the phone and interested in trying to figure out a way to do something. I think it's really complex for our industry because things like the Paycheck Protection Plan don't really incentivize demand, don't really incentivize people to drill. And then the administration is really fighting with, um, you know, I think what they may or may not have told OPEC, you know, behind, you, not behind her back, but um, not in light of the media about if OPEC does these cuts, then we won't help oil and gas, we won't help U.S. shale. I think there may be some of that kind of um, back channel communication that's happened uh, between Washington and Riyadh and Moscow. Of course, things we don't know. What about demand loss, you know, un unprecedented demand loss? Can you share Canary's uh, strategy or plans to try to manage that? Right now, no one's going anywhere. Yeah, no, it's, it's really quite severe, right? So, you know, I think back, and this seems like simpler times, but in January, I was concerned about, you know, we get our wellheads manufactured in China. I was concerned about supply chain, and we have a, a manufacturing plant in Oklahoma, but how much can we keep up if we can't get stuff from China? Boy, that seems like a, a ages ago and a, and a simple problem compared to what I'm dealing with, what we're dealing with now in Canary. Um, the demand loss, I think, is just, you know, you see it out there. You know, one of my friends um, that I follow on Twitter texted me that, hey, you know, here's my car being towed because it wouldn't start because I don't use it. And I thought, well, hey, 
I need to go check my car because wow. we don't, you know, I, I'm not using that. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, you know, thankfully it started, but uh, that just, I think is symptomatic for what's going on with America. We're not driving and we're not flying and demand is down 25, 30%. And we don't even know, you know, right now we're in this kind of fog of war where we've got the unemployment number, getting the inventory number and the rig count for oil and gas, but we really don't know what the U S production is. And we really don't know in real time what the refineries are processing. Um, but it's, it's, it's going to be amazing to see this data come in. And of course, speaking of not knowing, uh, you know, trying to predict the future, of course, we're all trying to figure that out. Do you think there's a time that we'll start to be a little more optimistic about the U.S. shell market? Should be, we be already being optimistic to try to navigate through? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's you know, I, I, I'm really hanging on the phrase right now, it's always darkest before the dawn. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I also, there's, I'm going to screw it up, but there's a Kobe Bryant quote that's, you know, when, you know, after I fall, I rise and rise and rise. And I, you know, try to channel both of those things right now. But the, the truth of the matter is, um, you know, it's a very difficult environment. But I think that there's, there's room for optimism here. Look, the government is going to have to overstimulate the economy because there's going to be deflationary pressure. Mm -hmm. The government is going to have to put enough money into the helicopter money into the economy that somebody's buying a house and a few people are buying cars. The economy is not going to come back until, you know, and I'm, I'm making these numbers up, but, you know, half a percent of people buy a home in the quarter and, you know, two or three percent of people buy a new car in the quarter. Until that kind of stuff happens, the government's going to have to keep spending because entire portions of the economy rely on, you know, realtors and, and people doing mortgages rely on home sales. You know, obviously there's a whole industry built around selling cars. Until we can get the confidence back up that's going to happen and that they're going to have to spend, which is going to be inflation, which is going to push the oil price up. And then part of the overhang. And I mean, this craziness with oil going negative with the May contract and all mm -hmm. it, it's about storage. And so once we start driving again, we're going to burn off that storage and burn off those excess barrels and we'll see a supply and demand cross. And with, within 18 months, we're going to see at least a mini oil. Move. What about <laughs> if you can, uh, Dan, thank you, you know, share, your thoughts with your colleagues, you know, who are in the industry right now uh, about the ups and downs. You're a veteran in the industry. You've been through ups and downs. Maybe some haven't, but are you, do you have any words there, you know, continuing your message that you can share with us? Yeah. I um, mean, I'm, I'm on some, some group chats with some other CEOs and, and senior executives, and I've talked to our senior management team quite a bit. Um, I think that, you know, first of all, we're all going through this together in the industry and, you know, we've seen um, suppliers and vendors really work with us. And we've seen customers, at least tr some, at least try to keep us busy. Um, and so we, you know, try to make the, the entire chain kind of more efficient so we can be competitive against OPEC, I think is one thing. And the other thing is to just, just realize this isn't forever. This is a, you know, a two month or a four month or an eight month situation. And, you know, there will be some good times later in 2020 and 21 and beyond. I really appreciate your thoughts and your expertise there and really you sharing the, the strategy and thoughts of Canary. We wish you the best in navigating through all of this as well, Dan. Uh, thank, thank you very much. And, you know, I, I hope that yeah, you and your family stay safe. Thank you. I hope the same for you. For more hard energy videos, follow our social media channels.